Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about an art in film, television and in books. And today I'm carrying on with this, you know, series of videos about how we can improve as readers by thinking about some of the issues or potential problems or techniques or aspects like that that can impact our reading. And that if we are aware of them, if we pay attention to them, then we can mitigate the detrimental aspects and actually incorporate any of the positive aspects into our ability as readers. And the thing that I wanted to talk about today has to do with awareness that we are not the only reader, that there is, for lack of a better term, an intended audience for the text. Now, in a lot of discussions about literature, there, there's a big focus on um, subjective opinion. Oh, objectively, this is a good book or a bad book. I'm not addressing that today. We know how we react to a text. That is the one thing that we are always certain about, how we felt when we read it. But as with all of these things, we are imperfect beings. We we are not always the person that was meant to read the text, who the text was for. And because of that, our reactions, while they are the reactions that we had, are not necessarily a fair judge of the text. So this has to do with the intended audience, the, the type of book, and uh, what the book was trying to do. So let's start with a very, very simple example. And, and again, like a lot of the examples I pick, I try to pick very extreme examples so that we can see how clearly this thing is working. Because as soon as we move on to more complex examples, it becomes much more nuanced and there's a greater variability in gray area. But let's think about a book that has been written for children, for five-year-olds that this is a very simple, straightforward book. Uh, maybe an early chapter book, maybe a picture book with text, but this is a book for five-year-olds. And if we, as a reader, sat down with it, we're like, oh, well, this is overly simplistic. This is very basic. This doesn't have any depth of character. Um, the, the characters in it are two-dimensional. They're plot functions. We could criticize all of it. And the thing is, this book for five-year-olds might be absolutely perfect for five-year-olds. But from our position, it's, ter it's terribly written. It doesn't do any of the things that we value in a text. In that example, we are clearly not the intended audience. This is a book that was intended to be read by five-year-olds or to five-year-olds. And if we as an adult are reading it for our own enjoyment, people do but we apply the same criteria that we would apply to an adult text we're not judging the book fairly are we and this is a very very stark example of when we are not the intended audience now what about a book that is meant to be a thought experiment the intended audience for a book that's meant to be a thought experiment. We see this a lot in science fiction. We see it in some fantasy, but we see it a lot in science fiction. When a book is written to be a thought experiment, the intended audience is an audience that wants to engage with that. They're not engaging with it in terms of traditional narrative. That's not what the book is trying to do. It's not the, what the intended readership for that book wants to get out of it. So if we read a thought experiment novel and we go, oh, but uh, the narrative structure here is, is all wonky and the character development and the character arcs don't work. And this is all absolutely ridiculous because this is really contrived and this would never work out this way. And how does this world even function? Again, we're applying a set of criteria and these criteria may be really important to us as readers. Absolutely. And it's not saying that you can't have these criteria, but 
That's not what that book was trying to do. That's not what the intended audience for that book wanted it to do. Because remember, fiction, while we use this general term, fiction, for all of these books, literature, for all of these books, the sheer variability about what these books are doing, exploring, how they explore them, there is a near infinite variety in the types of books, not even talking about genre, but the types of books. Are these books meant to be didactic? Are they meant to be critical of certain positions? Are they explorations of something? And if we go in with the same expectation that every book we read is going to be catered to our own personal set of criteria for what a good book is, quite often, A, we are not going to get the best out of that novel, out of that book, out of that story, out of that narrative. We're not going to get the best out of it because we have entered in with a set of presumptions and are applying those and we're not looking at what the text is doing. We're taking an external set of values, we're plunking it down on the text and saying it must conform to this in order to be good. B, we're not taking into account what the intended audience of that text wanted to get from the text. And again, no one is saying that you have to do any of these things. But if we're going to try and understand and evaluate texts, being aware of the original intended audience or the target audience for something, that can be invaluable information because it may not include us. And therefore, we have to think about not only how we reacted to reading it, but also the fact that someone else may have approached it in a very different way. And if we can think like that type of audience member, that type of reader, we might get much more from the text. And so this is why intended audience or the type of book that it is, is important. If something is a parody of 1960s and 1970s comedy and we react to going oh but this is very offensive about this thing but isn't that a parody of how the thing actually appeared in order to do the parody they had to represent it and maybe exaggerate doesn't mean that we have to like it it doesn't mean that we have to approve of it but if we understand that it's parody we understand that it's not the same lens. It's not the same approach to storytelling. If we see something that is a satire, again, a satire is not the same as a straightforward retelling of a story. It is doing something different. And an audience that is interested in the satire of a subject are usually audiences, A, interested in the subject, and B, interested in satire. And if we regard it as a straight text, as a normal text, as a normal novel, we're ignoring what the book is doing and how it is appealing to its audience, the people interested in that. And this, I had a recent discussion with um, Alex from Books with Banks about presentism. This, you can see the links between presentism as a concept and what I'm talking about here where presentism is, again, imposing modern-day cultural values onto a text and judging the text through that lens instead of trying to understand what the text is doing, what the text is exploring, what the text is trying to communicate. And that's why being aware of audience and intended audience the placement of a book in a genre? Is it trying to achieve mass market appeal? Because not every book does. Is it trying to appeal to the greatest genre audience that it possibly can? Because not every book does. What assumptions are being made about who that audience is? This author, when they are writing for an intended audience, may be making assumptions about the audience that they're speaking to. And that can be revelatory as soon as we start thinking about, this is a text that was written. Who was it written for? Why is it doing these things? And we bring this into an understanding 
and it can give us insight into the author, into the process, into the genre, into the time period and culture in which the, the narrative was produced. By considering intended audience, by considering the assumptions made about audience, by considering the type of book it is, all of those things can add to our understanding of the text in front of us. If we say, oh, but this is an epic fantasy. I know what epic fantasy does. I've read lots of epic fantasy. When we talk about a lot of the commercial genres and the uh, subgenres that we use to identify aspects, quite often they're used to identify content aspects. So epic fantasy typically is um, not necessarily a secondary world, but usually a secondary world, it usually is in a grand scale. But epic fantasy is not necessarily military fantasy. There, there can be distinctions. And we go into an epic fantasy expecting a big military battlefield thing, then we can be very, very disappointed when it's actually epic in the sense of, say, the Greek epics, when it's talking about an epic journey when it's talking about almost a, a series of picaresque adventures on this grand epic journey that involves gods and demigods, but no big conflicts, no big battles. And it's because our assumption made about what epic fantasy is, our understanding of the term, what that means in terms of the intended audience. Well, I like epic fantasy, therefore I will like this. But also what the book is trying to explore and if we then say this is a bad epic fantasy because it's not doing the things that I want in epic fantasy, then we again are placing ourselves as the audience. And we're not thinking about the type of audience it might appeal to. And that involves us making assumptions about it. But it means that we can try and place ourselves in the position of that imagined audience and look at it and go, hmm. Now, if I wasn't who I was, if I was a member of this audience, would I enjoy it? And this is, is part of what I talk about when I've discussed reviews in the past, that yes, as a reviewer, when you're reviewing a work, you're exploring what it is doing, but your own personal enjoyment, that, that's only ever a very tiny fraction of what you're exploring and reviewing in a text. It's not just about how much you enjoyed it or what you liked, because as a reviewer, you are trying to explain and evaluate the book so that potential buyers or people potentially interested in it will know about it, will understand whether or not it's a worthwhile investment of their time. And we write reviews for the public. Therefore, we're writing it for people unlike ourselves, because not every member of the public is like us. So this is all a roundabout way of, of trying to explore the concept that we are not always the intended audience. We are not always who the book is aimed at. And because of that, the usual criteria that we apply may not be the criteria that we should be applying. If we were to evaluate Twilight, is Twilight a good book? Uh, I've talked about this before. It is a terrible fantasy novel. It, it doesn't work as a fantasy novel in terms of the genre. Does it work as a horror novel? Not really. It doesn't really work as a horror novel doesn't lean into those things. Does it work as a romance novel? Hmm. And as soon as we take that lens, this is intended as a romance novel. Suddenly we see that a lot of the elements in it that would annoy a horror fan, that would annoy a fantasy fan, that would annoy an urban fantasy fan, a lot of those elements are now actually prose. They are positive elements because they are elements from romance storytelling. Does that mean it is a good book? And we'll get on to, in a later video, absolutism and uh, simplistic binaries and reductive labels. That, that's a separate video. 
it doesn't necessarily mean that Twilight is a good book, but it is going to be better for a certain audience than it is for other audiences. And paranormal romance and romance lovers and supernatural romance lovers, they might find it far more palatable, far more engaging, far more enjoyable and a much better book than someone who is a big horror fan. And they had picked it up because it had vampires and werewolves in it. And it was set in uh, a strange secluded locale and the wilderness and the woods nearby and they were expecting a horror story and that's not what it is so it would be a bad horror novel but it could be fairly okay decent to middling paranormal romance for particularly a younger audience rather than an older audience and why would you say that well it's not particularly racy it's it's quite chaste in how it pursues romance. So it's much more acceptable and much easier and more palatable for a younger audience because it is more chaste than it would be if it was more explicit and raunchy and steamy. And you get what I mean. Because there are different audiences and different audiences think about books, think about narratives and what they want to see in those narratives. We all have different criteria and therefore thinking about that audience, instead of thinking there is some simple, straightforward, objective criteria for writing, there are things that we can say objectively about the craft of writing. But even then, those are criteria that we have picked, that we have chosen from our perspective and given weight and value to. So even the selection of criteria that we make is already an element of subjectivity. But you can evaluate on a sentence level. Is it well written on a sentence by sentence basis? And then you apply the filter and lens of intended audience. Is it well written or is it um, good enough for this standard of reading? Is it overly simplistic? Are there grammatical mistakes? Do the grammatical mistakes add to the artistic elements or do they detract from the artistic elements? Because remember, fiction is not report writing. And therefore, it, there is an element of art to it which can require digressions from grammatical certainty. These are all considerations and they're all considerations that involve how we think about the intended audience for something, the genre, the type of book that it, it is. If it is trying to conform to genre norms, if it is trying to subvert genre norms, if it is trying to argue against genre norms, these are all factors. And some of these factors will appeal to different audiences. If you're slightly tired with a lot of cliche ridden fantasy you might really highly value something that is subverting or advancing a counter argument to those supposed norms if you're someone who really loves that type of fantasy then that book is going to be incredibly frustrating it's the same book it's written the same way but what the book is doing who it is doing it for who it is intended for who it is trying to please are radically different people. And so this is just to say, it is not an essential element to understand everything about a book and its intended audience and its place in, the, in whatever genre and the culture in which it is written. It's not a necessity. But the more we are aware of these things, the more that we are aware that these are even considerations, even if we don't know anything about them, that can help us refine our approach and understand the text in front of us better. And that's all that this is. Because if we assume that we are the intended audience, that what we desire for, what we want in, what our criteria for a narrative, if, if we have localized that solely in ourselves, about pleasing our individual preferences and biases and, and backgrounds. We're ignoring the fact that these books are not 
produced for us as individuals. They are produced for audiences and they are produced in a time and place that has different approaches to genre and culture and storytelling. And it's simply being aware of that and taking that awareness into account when we are discussing and engaging with texts. That's all that this is. But anyway, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. And I will see you in the next one.